Welcome. Dan and I are so happy to be here with you this afternoon. Our goal is to share, share our stories, our journey, and our advice. Building online education at the college level is easy on paper, but any process it expects sweeping change in how faculty deliver curriculum requires leadership, patience, and a student-focused faculty philosophy. Today's presentation allows me and Dan to share with you. So baby steps. My journey started in 2007. Distance learning was perceived negatively and it was simply not viewed as a scholarly pursuit. But my dean at my prior institution, Dowling College, had a vision. She wanted us to build online programs. So early in 2007, we had an early system of offering online courses to our corporate sites. Federal Express was a big one. Blackboard offered a filing cabinet platform but the student had to be explicitly told where to go find a document and what to do with it. July through November of 2007, the Dowling Provost and the union signed a memorandum of agreement naming me as a faculty coordinator to co-author the college's first New York State distance program. And it was the MBA in management. We were making it known to the market that we were now getting engaged and getting involved. In December of 2007, the Faculty Senate had to create a policy on teaching online courses. And this was meaningful for us because it was a corner we turned that meant that the culture was beginning to change. By August of 2008, the Dowling faculty had to agree to expectations related to teaching online transitioning the faculty who were accustomed to showing up at a designated room with defined hours required a cultural shift. Expectations required responsiveness of the faculty, availability, and creating student engagement. February to September of 2009, I drafted with the provost and submitted the substantive change form for Middle States Commission. This was scary. You are now making known to the authority that gives you the right to grant a degree that you're making such a significant change to your organization's ability to function that you have to submit this substantive change. So we proceeded very carefully and ultimately we were successful. By December of 2010, with our approvals, the early technology was starting to be integrated. And it was awkward, especially when you're using multimedia, screen capture, and like Camtasia Studio 7 and Audacity were difficult for many of us to use because of our lack of experience. But for early adopters, it was a very, it was a very exciting time. In 2011, we published our first standard syllabus for online education in leadership. And that was a, a big deal. In 2012, I left Dowling College and I joined the faculty at Malloy. And then in January of 2013 at Malloy, the leadership was still resistant to this crazy idea of being able to offer online education. It's a new college. So I did a pilot, a little bit in secret, within my graduate ethics course. I was able to then illustrate to the VPAA that students were extremely happy with that delivery system. And as a result, she began to allow us to start to make some further changes. February to October of 2013, our Malloy president was starting to get excited uh, and, and, and serious. So the faculty had to design an attendance policy that would acknowledge hybrid classes. And we also, which I'll talk about a little more, 
had to create a clarity on the federal seat time and also the New York State education policy on the minutes, we'll call it. We also had to understand how we were gonna use this old legacy system, which was called Lion's Den, as our learning management system. We didn't have one yet. In spring of 2014, the college finally approved our ability to hire an instructional designer. It was like such a big deal. I was lucky to serve on the search committee. And by fall of 2000, spring of 2014, we had a full-blown policy that began to make clear to the faculty what the hybrid policy was. And we also, we, we hired in the fall our instructional designer. While this was going on, the literature was guiding us as well. In 2009, this summer, there was a great article published titled Education at a Distance. Insights from this study shared with innovative colleges that one, instructors must provide support for the platform. It's not just okay to do the content. Also, many of the students within the distance coursework were non-traditional. These students had greater work-life experience as well as demands. Their experiences demanded in the faculty more meaningful assignments and experiences in, in this non-traditional space. And the realization started to emerge that online students, when compared to traditional students, needed more self-discipline and they needed to take more responsibility for their learning. In fall 2010, there was a great article published titled College Students' Attitudes Toward the Frequency of Types of Technology for Online Learning. And I was very uh, happy that my colleagues from Dowling College were part of the author group of this article. The study examined the perception of students regarding the technology. Insights that were gained was one, students feel a need for activity on a regular basis. They want at least weekly a discussion board or some activity. Plus they want a quiz at least monthly so they know they're staying on track. Second insight was one-way communication between the faculty sending only outward is not going to be acceptable to these students. They demanded two-way dialogue. And third, generally, that students preferred the autonomy of asynchronous sessions versus defined synchronous sessions. Then in 2010, a wonderful article was published called A Comprehensive Student-Based Analysis of Hybrid Courses, Student Preferences and Design for Success. My, uh, this was published by a group of Monmouth faculty, and I had the privilege and still am so excited about the outcome of hiring one of these faculty, Dr. Dan Ball, who you'll get to spend quite a bit of time with later on. So the insights from this study revealed, one, that students are able to acclimate to an online educational system, even though it's a new experience. Second, if there are insufficient student opportunities, engagement, discussion boards, or ways for students can talk to other students and the faculty, they feel disconnected. They do not want correspondence courses. And third, there was a conclusion from these, these uh, scholars that hybrid delivery, delivery was on the upswing. Fully online class segments at this time, still, this is 10 years ago, still made students feel a little disengaged. And then in 2013, the New York Times published an article called Trouble with Online Colleges. And they found that the hybrid classes performed, students in those classes performed just as well as students in traditional classes. But there was a lot of attrition in the online coursework unless the, the students were highly motivated. So as I gently mentioned earlier, one of, and as we began to move forward, one of the biggest issues for college leadership was the compliance with the federal and the New York State 
seat time. And that's what defines how long a student has to be engaged in either instructional taught work or, or non-instructional work, homework, studying for an exam, in order to meet the requirements of a one, two, or three credit course. So this was extremely important to us to first understand what the regulations were. So in the past, you just showed up during your time and you knew you were meeting some level of expectation. It requires, the, the, the rules require that for every one hour of instructional time, there must be two hours of non-instructional time. Students studying for an exam, or perhaps they're um, speaking to colleagues on the homework, or they're working on, a, on writing an individual paper. So that's non-instructional time, two hours for every one hour in the classroom. So we began to build that, and that gave, again, the, the leadership more confident that we knew what we were doing. Plus now, because we started to move forward and there were certain, certainly early adopters and early um, innovators, we needed to start creating some policies. So the policies included, and this is actually um, the actual narrative, training. You had to cert be certified as competent in order to use the system, and again, the old system was the lion's den, but you had to be able to navigate it. We also had, again, an early lecture capital soft, uh, capture software, which finally merged into Panopto. And you have to be able to use the anti-plagiarism software. So they had to show competence. Also, you have to create an environment that's engaging to the students, just as if he or she were in the classroom. It has to be varied opportunities for the student to interact with the other students as well as yourself, the faculty member. And the faculty member needs to begin to make an articulated commitment to when he or she will be available. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but they had to really truly indicate, if you write to me, how many hours will I get back to you? One hour office hours once a week was not gonna work any longer plus very clear expectations for the student had to be articulated at the start of the experience, not uh, chapter by chapter. And there had to be varied assessment opportunities. So you could not have just a midterm and a final. You had to have opportunities throughout the class so that the student one knew he or she was staying on track. And you as the professor also knew that you weren't losing your students. Concepts of low stake testing emerged that really helped students know that they were staying on track, pay for performance related to reading the chapters and the reading the material. And at the same time, no one assessment is gonna devastate these students. So this is our process. And on one side, you could say this is the future process, but this is really articulating what we did to be successful. And as you can see by this model, of designing and then teaching and then bringing humanization into the experience, improving it, supporting and learning, and then redesigning it. So it is a closed loop that includes continuous improvement at its foundation, but it always starts with teaching. So remember I shared earlier that the challenge was, as with the Dowling faculty, this perception that the distance education is less than a face-to-face -face teaching model. So this challenge starts our journey. And this model, this earthiness of this model for continuous improvement has to begin here. Some faculty felt that online education would, would attract lazy professors and also encourage students to be lazy. So that's why there was a resistance. Also, there was a concern that online educated a education had a limit to the ability to engage the student, to feel that sense of ebb and flow between mentor and mentee. So it created a bit of a flashback to the old correspondence courses that were more in trade schools of a billion years ago, which obviously scholars in, in at the college level wanted nothing to do with it. So my experience was to find champions, individuals who really were willing to play with the technology and to begin, begin, begin the process of learning. My dean at Dowling College had selected me as a champion, and I was very fortunate to have my colleague, Dr. Dan Ball, 
as a champion at Malloy College. So if you have the right faculty and you have the right uh, commitment, then you can begin to move to the next step, which is to humanize the experience for the students. So this step is crucial, not just for the student, but also for the professor. Many faculty joined the academy because it was a meaningful profess profession to help others learn. The faculty member gains just as much from the student as a student gains in the transfer of knowledge from the faculty member. This humanization of the online experience is one of the most important steps in this process. So for the faculty member, it keeps the professor linked to the student. The learning experience remains a priority for the professor. The human connectedness of, between the professor and the student keeps both fully engaged. The student, the knowledge needs to go way beyond the textbook or any material. The professor still needs to be the mentor. And that the culture, the community, the classroom must still be fully engaged. So there has to be a community of learning. A student is not alone in this process. There are classmates that he or she can call upon during the learning experience. So for myself and sharing my own journey, one of the first things that I did to humanize the experience, which was a little controversial, I gave everybody my cell phone and said they could call whenever they wanted. And I said, you know, if I'm sleeping, then obviously leave a message. But this for me made me feel that I was present. And students, if they're doing an exam at 10 30 at night, they could call me and that anxiety would be calm because they knew I was available to them. Also, I always opened my classes at least one month before the start of class. So the student can engage the online system, they can fool around with the the technology, they can navigate, and if there's questions, I am available. So my third pro, uh, commitment was to be engaged. I was interacting with the students. I was letting them pick topics early. I was available to them. So by the time the class started, we were all friends. And then I always had a synchronous first class, always that first day. Now, by now, we've all been, most have been talking to each other, problems of scheduling or conflicts have been resolved. But first day of class, we all see each other's faces, we create our teams, we pick our topics, and there is an actual class experience, not just one-way communications. Then multiple discussion forums are integrated into the course design, and everyone has to do an online presentation within the course that's observed by the other students. So again, it builds that community of learning. So the natural next step is to improve. So now we've got these, these early and innovators who've been now putting this experience into the universe. And next thing you know, we're able to say, what did we do well and what do we need to do better? I found for myself and even to this day, every single semester I rewrite my syllabi in my courses to tweak expectations, adjectives, verbs to make sure there's more and more clarity for the student. And for me, that makes the student more accountable to the success of his or her learning experience. So as we begin to go to that next step and we think about, okay, what do you integrate as far as the improvements? Clear expectations for the students. Also clear deadlines. When does an exam open and when does it shut? What time? This way students, I guess, especially those pursuing a world of management, they need to learn self-discipline. Also, we started to use recordings to a much greater extent. Mini recordings were fantastic. And what was also helpful was feedback to the student. So if I had observed a student presentation or I had watched, um, I, I had read the paper, I could not only give the student the graded marked up document, but I could describe to them in a mini recording what they can do better, what they did beautifully and move forward from there. But the mini recordings for difficult concepts was also extremely valuable. My colleague, Dr. Ball, when he took on the course he's gonna chat about, he recorded 39 mini recordings 
And that allowed the student to navigate the complexity of the material. Also, students did a lot of self-evaluations and peer evaluations. Plus, they gave, I had special online um, feedback sessions so that students who were in an online or hybrid class would give us feedback so that we could improve it over time. And then ultimately, lots of little quizzes. Pre-quiz allowed the students to play with the navigation of the, camp, of the uh, learning management system. So they first time they're touching it is not in a live quiz. And also the ability to have little teeny low stake testing quizzes. So you may take a quiz every week it's worth 1% of your grade, again, keeps the student on track. So these were major improvements that did not happen overnight. So we go from improvement and then we bring in support and learn. That's the next step. So within the School of Business, we are a strong community and the online professors especially were very generous with their time and their talent. So. We would include the faculty in each other's courses. I might sit into Dr. Bull's class, observe how he might work. We have another super user, Professor Loschiavo, and myself, any faculty was welcome to be part of my class as well. We learned from each other. We constantly had large, I'll say go-to meetings, where any of the faculty who were teaching online, full-time or adjuncts, we're able to share the ups and the downs and give each other advice. And we also share tools. So we've got some hints and clues of what, how we can make our class better. And as I shared, we had that separate survey system that allowed our students to tell us what we were doing well and what we were doing poorly. Now, the next step though, is to give feedback to those faculty who are teaching in the online world. Our current college-wide assessment system was not eloquent enough to give the professor what he or she needed. So we created and again, collectively agreed upon what do we expect of the, ourselves? So this document allowed more experienced online faculty to observe developing online faculty and even every other year or every year just to get back on track, make sure you're not losing your, your, your style have someone observe your class. So you can see by this form, the faculty member would take a look at the online design and see, did the professor open the course a month early or at least a week early? Was it fully populated? Was there some type of live introduction to welcome the student, if not a synchronous session? And was the course fully populated, not just chapter by chapter? In this part of the evaluation, there was, is the design of the course student-centered? So that you're not just, oh, I'm sending you knowledge, but is the student able to gain the knowledge? And also, is the syllabus clear? Is it easy to understand? Are the student resources clearly articulated and available? And also, is it easy to navigate? And then the last section of this faculty interaction evaluation was the professor. Is he or she present? Do you see that the professor is in answering the questions on a timely basis, giving meaningful feedback, and also communicating in a clear and effective way? Then the observer would meet with the professor and give feedback. And this evaluation then would go to the faculty's evaluation folder and would stand it as evidence of improvement. And then the next step, which of course for the closing of the continuous improvement circle is redesign. So you've learned, you've helped each other, and now what do you do now? You, do you fix it? What can be done? What's the new expectation? So as this moves forward and then we begin to go through the cycle again, the faculty begin to change that perception of online education being less than. So the program began to grow. In fall of 2014, we had two online hybrid courses. These innovative faculty worked through the kinks. By spring of 16, we had seven online courses. By 17, they were 10. By fall of 2019, 44% of the sections were online or heavily hybrid. 
And then we were moving to the graduate level of 63%. And now it's just, there are some programs that are fully online. So it's been an amazing experience. Now I'm very happy to be able to invite my colleague, Dr. Dan Ball. I want to have him share the amazing work that he has done so that you as our audience can really understand a real world case example. Dr. Ball has gone through every one of these steps, designing, teaching, humanizing, improving, and redesigning. So now I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Dr. Dan Ball. Thank you very much. Uh, as Dr. Maureen McKenzie Ruppel just shared some very important concepts regarding building online programs and best practices as to how we can guide the faculty, I want to shift the gears a little bit and now look at that model that she presented. In order to have a successful online program, we need to look at the course level and also have successful online courses. And to develop our courses, I want to look at two perspectives. The first perspective is from the faculty side. Now, as faculty, as we're developing online courses, we want to be pedagogically sound, deliver the course content that we normally would in a traditional face-to-face -face setting to make sure we're achieving the same overall learning objectives. But we need to also put ourselves in the student's shoes. We may have barriers initially in the online world that we have to overcome, but if we design this properly, it's not just about overcoming these barriers, we may be able to have the students thrive in a way that they might not have in a traditional face-to-face -face setting. So we need to develop the courses to deliver the content, yet also have a very navigable site so that the students can learn and be comfortable throughout this process. So I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the technology that we've had and where we're at now. Going back into history a little bit, our old computers, they may have taken up an entire room. We're not at that point anymore. We've evolved from there. Our communication technology, not as advanced as where we are. And finally, the idea to capture video really is a game changer in terms of delivering effective online education. My very first experiences with an online type of course was a distance learning course, and this was in the late 90s. I had taken a course, it was a C++ course, and at the time it was state of the art. Each week I would get a video cassette in the mail which was a recording of an actual classroom lecture. And so the institution that developed this program, they basically, in the back of the room, they had a video camera system and they would record everything that was happening within the classroom. I got to witness that, but it was also very much a one-way type of a learning situation. I was not part of the community. I always had a time lag in terms of the information and a week later getting it. So we're definitely at a better state now. As you can see, what we have here is we now have a hub of possible technology at our disposal. In addition to those mainframe computers being moved into laptops, tablets, uh, our cell phones, we can do so much virtually. This conference is now a virtual conference. So that same idea, that same concept, we can bring now into our course design. So I just want to talk a little bit about a specific course and an example that I think will hopefully help you. In the MBA program, as students enter the program, typically they have one of three introductory courses that they may be able to take. A business ethics course, a course in marketing, and then a course in quantitative analysis to support managerial decisions. Now, also remember, that students in an MBA program have a very diverse background, educational background, professional backgrounds. They may be re-entering school after having been away from the undergraduate curriculum and knowledge for quite some time. And many may not have taken math courses in years. But each of these courses is so essential because they provide foundational material for successive courses in the program. 
So what we need to do is, is develop these courses in a way that the student will engage and be able to be successful throughout the program. Now, I initially would think the quantitative analysis class might be the most difficult class to, to do in an online setting. My introduction, my introduction to online teaching and hybrid teaching was around 2010 or so. And at that time, I really was, I was recording lectures into PowerPoint slides and, and uploading that and providing materials for the students and trying to be as engaging and interactive as possible. And at that point, I really thought that a quantitative class is the most difficult to do. I'm not sure it really can be done. Well, with the technology we have now and how I've grown over the time, it definitely can be done and can be done in a very successful way. So what is this course all about? Well, it's really a course about decision making. So we make decisions all the time. Whether we're in the boardroom making strategic decisions for an organization, we're deciding between multiple alternatives, or we're just taking information and we're processing that information and then making a decision. So it's really about decision making. So how could we accomplish this at a managerial level? Well, we could just take the information, think about it and make a split decision. It may work, oftentimes it does not work. We could go back to our time trusted method of using the magic eight ball. Again, not one that I would recommend, especially when making some very critical decisions. Or we could use the field of business analytics, management science, operations research, take all of our mathematical tools we have, take the information, utilize that technology and process it to make very sound business decisions. So that's what this course really is about. It's about taking that information, taking that data, teaching the student to build and utilize models to make decisions. As you can see, we have a lot of topics that the students are learning. And this is all in a very short seven week session. Everything from bringing in that probability and statistics background that may have been years prior that the student initially learned, decision analysis, regression analysis, there's a lot here. And oftentimes students are a little intimidated when they see this, especially if they have not been in the classroom in a while. And we need to build their confidence, teach this material, to the level that is at a graduate level and then have them be successful not only in the program but as they move throughout their careers. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at our materials and the technology. We have our traditional textbook. We have supplementary information as my colleague Dr. Mackenzie Ruppel shared. The humanization is so important that the faculty be there for the student and provide that personality and that experience that the faculty member has. So developing Word documents, making PDFs, taking the notes that you might use in the classroom and making that available. Spreadsheet software is very important for this type of a course. And then we have our learning management system. We used Canvas. Uh, there are many of them out there, but having a very, uh, Organized learning management system is crucial for the development and success of a course. And then Panopto. Other lecture capture programs are also, are also very, very widely used and very successful. The example I will show you, we used Panopto. And again, it helps you bring that video component into the classroom. So as Dr. Mackenzie Ruppel shared, having an introductory synchronous session is so important and we do that. We have a meeting where the students can get online, have web cameras open so they can see each other and develop a sense of community so they don't feel like it's an independent study or it's a one-way uh, correspondence with only the faculty member. Going over the syllabus, explaining how the technology will be used, answering any questions, and then a real key point is the record. Being able to record that introductory session so that students can go back, rewatch it, or if they were unable to make that session, they still can go back and learn what happened and, and get the overall, uh, the overall objectives of the course and ground rules as to how we'll progress. So what does the course shell look like? Well, here's just an example. In this particular class, the students are welcomed with a a message which describes the objectives, the overall uh, philosophy of that particular course. 
the syllabus, it's very important to not only have a very, very strong and detailed syllabus, but also to take as much of that information as you can and put that into the learning management system. As you can see on the screen, what we have here is we have all of the due dates, all of the main milestones that are in the syllabus, but now we've put them also into the learning management system. As the students are managing their time, they may have this on an app on their phone, which will sync to their calendar and will help them to make sure that they stay on point throughout the semester and they stay engaged and they don't miss those deadlines. As we move into modules, now modules is where the real course and the real content is, is situated, one place where the students can go. And I have a few sections I just wanna point out here. The first one, is has has three components and the first piece of that is where we could embed a video of that introductory syllabus overview uh, how we may uh, how we may recommend that the student navigate the course so we have some navigation tips and that's another video that can be embedded in there where we really screen capture the entire learning management system site for this course and just walk the student through it so they know exactly how everything is laid out and then some guidelines some suggestions on how the student can uh, successfully proceed throughout the course. Then we move into our modules. Now, what our modules are, this course had seven modules. So it was a seven week course and each module represented a different topic. So if you can recall a few slides back, we had an overview and we had just a listing of the topics that this course contains, the decision analysis, forecasting, and so on. So, I broke this so that each module is separate. Each module has a specific, uh, specific course topic. And the first module that I would like to just explain about is going to be how the break-even analysis module is set up. Now, in this module, opening up the module, the layout is the same. For all seven modules, the layout will be the same. We'll have an overview. So when we move into the overview section, here's what we have. We have an explanation of what this module is about. So it's about break-even analysis. The overall objectives, what the learning objectives are and the goals for this particular module, it gives the student an idea of the expectations and what they will get out of this. The dates that it's active, assessments, as Dr. McKenzie Ruppel shared, having that communication is so important. And here we're showing specifically in this module, how will you communicate with the instructor, with the students, and also with the content. And then links to the assignments and the deadlines are also included down at the bottom. Now we move into the next piece, which is really our virtual classroom. Now in the virtual classroom, what we want to do here is take what we would do in a face-to-face -face class setting and replicate that online. Not just put the materials up there and hope that the student can go in order and figure things out, but more specifically, how can, how can we take exactly the flow of a classroom and put that online? And that's what we're looking to do right here. So I took one example, which is the profit model. This is just one piece of the first module. And in here, I, took, I developed a few different documents, again, humanizing this process, making PDFs, so notes that you might put on the board or give as a supplementary note in the classroom, bring that into the, the module. And then templates. So here's an example. On the left, you'll see a theory. So I took the profit model and developed my own explanation of what's in the textbook. It's one thing to have it in the textbook. It's another thing for the faculty member to put their own personality and description and really decipher it and help the student learn. On the right, we take that profit model and we illustrate it with an example. So being able to show the theory and then a very clear example that's easily understood for the, for the student. Spreadsheets, we use spreadsheets in this class all the time. Having the templates ready for the student is important. And then the next piece are the videos. Now the videos are very important. What I have here is I have a video where I am talking, I am speaking, and I am explaining to the student what is happening and what I explained in the theory document as well 
as the example. So they can take notes, they can to listen to what I am saying, and then I go back and forth between those documents and an Excel spreadsheet. And I show the students how to input the data, how to input the information, and then ultimately, how to build an actual spreadsheet model. So you can see here, a student who doesn't know Excel can now watch this, replicate what I am doing with their template file, and then rewatch this, pause the video, go back and see the, see the lecture again. Getting what we would do in a classroom setting with laptops and computers in front of us, bring that to the student. And then finally, our deliverables, a discussion board, a homework assignment, and the homework is very similar to what we explained in, the, uh, in those online tutorial videos. So how do we flow the module? How does this flow? Well, each module, the student will go in, they will look at the overview of the module, and then after they read the overview, they'll mark it as done. That'll allow them to get to the next phase, which is that virtual classroom I just described, where they watch the videos, they look at the notes, they make notes on the notes, and then they replicate the examples that I did in the videos. Then again, they have to mark this as done with little virtual gates. Then they move to the homework. The homework is very similar to what was in the virtual classroom, but here they, I give them the answers but not the full solutions until they submit the homework. This gives them time to ask me for help. And if they're not getting the answers, they'll know something is wrong. Once they submit the homework, then those detailed solutions become available. And these detailed solutions include everything, include screen captures of my spreadsheets, notes of my formulas and my processes that I've used so that if they didn't get something right in the homework, they can ask me for help, but they also can make corrections and get it right uh, before they take a quiz. Now the quiz is based on the homework and the tutorial videos for this module. So as Dr. Mackenzie Ruppel shared, having frequent assessments and it's not cumulative as opposed to cumulative exams i want to build the student's confidence i want to chunk the content into modules once the student masters uh, masters break-even analysis then they will move on to decision analysis and once they master that they'll move on to regression and so on so in a seven-week session i want to make sure that everyone comes out of there feeling very confident so they've learned the material and they've also rebuilt and regained that confidence in the math and the topic area that they may have lost over years of not being in school. Then they move on to the next module. So just a few summary best practices. Uh, again, that introductory synchronous session, get everyone together, be able to provide uh, an explanation of the course, field questions, and also record it in case a student can't make it, record it so that they can go back to us. The consistent learning management shell, that's great so that from week to week to week, the student can gain confidence and understand and not be lost by trying to figure out where things are. Instead, spend that time focusing on the content and mastering that. And then in a program, if faculty can be consistent with how they lay out their courses, that makes that transition to the next course even easier. The chunking of information, learning one topic, learning it well, moving on to the next focus and master allow the students to focus on a content and then master that those virtual gates so students don't skip ahead and maybe get confused or overwhelmed by seeing what's coming up in two weeks just stay where they are and learn that the supplementary notes the tutorial videos those help again bring that faculty personality into the classroom and one of the keys is the step-by-step -step details and process I loved math as a student, I really did, but I also was very slow to learning it. I needed to take the content, really go back to the library, write everything down, take large problems, break them down into smaller steps, and learn that way. When teaching a mathematical course, or really any course online, we really need to be very cognizant of the fact that our audience, our students, they have so many different learning styles, and we need to make the material accessible to them and present it in a way that they can learn it and build that confidence. So we need to reach as many of those styles as we possibly can. And then finally, when this type of a course is built and you have a nice learning management system, 
then the other online courses, the blended and even face-to-face -face courses can still use this setup. So at this point, I'd like to pass the floor back over to my colleague, Dr. Maureen McKenzie Ruppel for some closing thoughts. So Dr. Ball, thank you so much. You really demonstrated the ability and for a faculty member to build, create a, a complicated set of knowledge transfer for within the online environment. So I'm really very grateful for everything that you've done and, and you've been a big mentor to many of the, of the junior faculty. So what we did here and before we close our presentation is just to pull some of the key themes. One is any college that wants to go down this path with this level of effort and energy must provide support for the faculty. Structural designers, you don't force the faculty, they have to be willing to do it on their own and come around, have mentors that will guide them. Also, you need support for students, whether it is faculty who are well-educated and teaching them the platform, but an understanding that not every student learns the same way as Dr. Ball shared. College-wide policies need to have a num of amount of flexibility, yet at the same time, make clear to the faculty that if you are going to engage in online education, it must be meaningful to the student. Also, to be clear on, to be close to the literature. What have people found as far as the experiences of students, the experiences of colleges that are early adopters, and use that knowledge so that you can not have to reinvent the wheel. Always humanize the online classroom. Use the right technology. And also always take the knowledge from your colleagues from other faculty, from the students, and redesign and improve your program. So we are thrilled that we were able to sp spend time with you today. This is our contact information. Uh, we are both more than uh, interested in spending time responding to any of your questions, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you very much.